it's Grant. Um, I have to say, uh, when I first uh, got the email from Grant asking me to do a Friday seminar, I was uh, really uh, flattered because uh, I was under the impression that Friday seminars are for people who are successful and famous, and I was like, <laughs> am I famous already? And but uh, obviously uh, not. And, and uh, anyway, uh, I'm just going to go ahead with the presentation today. So the topic is pre-concentration using high voltage pulses. Um, as Grant has just said, I'm um, about six, seven months away from my uh, uh, final system review. I have been to JK two years. And what I'm presenting today includes um, almost all the uh, research outcomes on my PhD. And um, and yeah, I'm just going to show you the overview of today's presentation. And I'm going to assume everyone who's sitting here knows about what the mining companies are dealing with right now, with the, with the declining head grade, with the increasing uh, amount of waste generated, blah, blah, blah. And I'm going to save you a lot of time by not talking about any of that. And I'm just going to jump straight to the uh, literature review with regards to high voltage pulses whereby I will be talking about the basic working principles of this technique and also about the major application of this technique and then just go on with my own work. So once again, it's a machine again. So that's the uh, self rack unit that I'm working on. Um, it's uh, manufactured in Switzerland and it's composed of four major parts, a power supply, a pulse generator, a discharge electrode and the uh, processing vessel. So the uh, power supply, it supplies power. Pulse generator generates electrical pulse and the uh, discharge channel, dis uh, sorry, discharge electrode discharge um, electrical pulses and it's gonna disintegrate the thing, the material that you put in that processing vessel. And there's a control panel over here whereby you can change the uh, pulse parameters, the voltage you can change from 90 to 200 and the uh, pulse frequency electrical gamut, blah, blah, blah. And uh, so what is really happening in that processing vessel? Um, it's, I have a photo showing over here. It looks pretty smoky because when it happens, it's, um, there's a lot of shock waves and stuff. It's pretty shiny, so it's not very clear, but it's actually pretty similar to the lightning we see. And um, this, Two photos are taken on the on the bridge, which connects the culture center and the casino. These two awesome photos. I've been showing them for all my reviews so far. <laughs> and um, so, what is happening in that processing vessel looks exactly like this. Just on the right, you have the discharge channel, ha electrical breakdown happening in sink air. But on the left, in the processing vessel, it's actually electrical breakdown happening in water and in rocks. So. Uh, I have a video over here showing um, uh, uh, lightning. I'm gonna do. A, I'm gonna try this to let you catch some um, interesting features about lightning. Okay. I can't seem to be coming to stop the video. Um, I was. What I was planning to do was to um, show you the expansion of the of the uh, domain discharge channel. So uh, you're supposed to see a very shiny bit of the, this thing with, with, I call the domain discharge channel. So um, this is expansion of the discharge channel and it is the expansion that matters to us um, because it is the uh, expansion of this domain discharge channel that leads to the fragmentation of rocks. And there's this one figure that's really important to high voltage pulses and it expands everything. It is the material breakdown field strength um, as a function of the voltage rising time. So when so when you apply a voltage in between um, in, in between a material, you have the voltage is right. It's always from zero to something, and and that time that span is called voltage rising time. And this 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 uh, material breakdown field strength of, uh, of a specific material. It's not really constant. It's a function of this rising time. And we have a figure that's showing four materials over here, oil, rock, water, and air. As you can see, the air breakdown field strength is really low. So in front of high voltages, air is actually very conductive. 
because the breakdown field strength is really low. That's why for the high voltage circuits, people don't really use air as an insulator. They use plastic, they wrap their wires in something because air is very conductive in front of high voltage. Um, now then we have water and rock. So to, to, to maximize our efficiency of fragmentation, we, we try to have the electrical pulse to go through the rocks. The lightning I just showed you, it was um, electrical breakdown happening in air, but we're trying to force the electrical breakdown to happen in, in rocks. Now, how do we do that? We, we actually change the uh, pulse rising time to be smaller than 500 nanoseconds, and we submerge our rocks in water. So by submerging our rocks in water, you first get rid of air because air is just so conductive. It's not going to go through the rock anymore. It's just going to go through air. So we get rid of air, and then we use the voltage, uh, voltage rising time that's smaller than 500 nanoseconds so that the breakdown field strength of rock is actually smaller than water. So the voltage would prefer to travel in rocks. So this is maximization of the fragmentation efficiency. Um, now, there are three major applications of this technique so far. That's um, um, enhanced liberation, pre-awakening, and pre-concentration. And I'm going to briefly, very briefly, talk about uh, liberation and pre-awakening because it's not really my area. Um, but still, uh, first, the uh, uh, liberation. So I have a photo on the left. That's the feed material. It's granite. And if you apply high voltage pulse design, you're going to crash them into three product, feldspar, quartz, and mica. As you can see, they're very well liberated. And this, of course, is just one um, study. Um, you have numerous other studies on numerous other ore samples. Probably all the ore minerals that I've, I've known, they have tested with high voltage pulses. And almost invariably, they're all saying they have very good liberation performance, and they do. And and another good thing with using high voltage pulse for liberation purposes is that you generate very little fine particles, which is something that we don't want. And, but the thing is that they always throw hundreds of pulses on just a small pile of rocks to crush them to, to micron sizes sometimes. And the energy consumption is just way too high. It's higher than any mechanical crushing methods, probably what, 30%, 50%, even double the energy input of, of all the um, mechanical crushing methods that you can find. So it's just very hard to convince people that saying, OK, good, I have a better pre liberation performance, um, and, but I just spent double the energy. That's just not convincing enough. And also, because you have to store hundreds of pulses on a small pile of rock, you waste a lot of time. That means the throughput is also very low. And the uh, maximum um, throughput that I know about using high voltage pulse to do liberation is only around a few hundred kilogram per hour, and that's really low. And the second implication, the pre-awakening. Um, so pre -awake, probably everyone aside from us in JK, they're dealing with liberation. So that's to me, that's just crazy. But over here in JK, we we recently had this pre-awakening and the pre-concentration application. And so pre-awakening, it's, it's just actually fairly easy. So you, you, you apply a certain amount of energy to every single particle. It's like the job weight test. So you, you put a certain amount of energy into every particle. And then you, you test the AB value of your treated product. And you realize after HVAB treatment, which is a very small amount of energy, and you have a significant enhancement with regards to the uh, AB value. And you realize this is this can achieve potential energy saving pe benefits for the downstream grinding process. But the, the thing is that to, to get the optimum pre-awakening results, you, it's better for you to, to process one rock at a time. And, and that's not good. Who wants to process one rock at a time? That's so inefficient. So, um, um, so then we have uh, the um, single particle, single pulse test method. It's similar as a job weight test again. Just instead of testing its amenability to mechanical methods, we have something that tests the amenability of this or to high voltage pulses. Just use a single particle. Uh, every single particle suffers one pulse, and yeah, you, you, you test the AB value. And it's just this one day, and this guy was doing this, he get really bored. But 
somehow I realized that looks like if a particle is enriched with matter, it's more likely to be broken. So say uh, this one, when you subject to one electrical pulse, it's more likely to be broken in comparison with the bearing rod. So, so they have this idea that if the metal is with metal, it's more likely to be broken. If it's bearing, it's less likely to be broken. And if you if you combine them, you're gonna have a you're gonna have a potential pre-concentration performance because the one with metal is gonna be crashed and it's gonna go to the screen on the side. So that's pre-concentration. Um, in the first study, when they were playing around with the synthetic particles, whereby they use bearing synthetic particles and they they embedded the bearing part synthetic particle with a with a mineral grain in there. They they realize um a hundred percent of the time the one that's embedded with metal is gonna be broken and but only fifty percent of the time the bearing one is gonna be broken. Now if you look at the first half of the sentence it's really good because a hundred percent of the time you're gonna crash the one with metal. But if you look at the later part of the sentence it's not good because you actually crash fifty percent of the bearing particles, which is something we don't want. Um, why would you crash waste rocks in the first place? So, talk a little bit about the um, advantages and the, the disadvantages of using this method to do pre-concentration. So you can achieve uh, feed all split by grade, and the energy consumption, once again, similar as pre-awakening, is relatively low. And for the results are all dependent. For some of the all samples, you can have post waste rejection, which is amazing. And in addition to this pre-concentration performance, the, the the particles that was treated, the awakening results are still there. So so pre-awakening has become an additional bonus to this whole thing, which is really good. But once again, um, the throughput is similar as pre-awakening. It's not very high. It's um, maybe using the pre-awakening station is going to be in between two to five tons per hour. And the energy transfer efficiency is not very high um, because once again, even if a rock is barren, you are still crashing it. So I'm, I'm gonna say the energy efficiency is not very high because you're still wasting the same amount of energy on a waste rock in comparison with a, a rock that's enriched with matter. And like I just said, 50% of the time you're gonna crash the rock that's barren. That's no good because you're crashing barren rocks. So you have a high breakage probability of the barren rocks. So when I first came to JK, I, um, we were suggesting that we will, I, I was just playing around with the machine. I just got finished my induction and everything. So I play around with the machine. I throw a group of particles in there. And it just so happens the first all sample that I throw in there was a Sosego, um, um, Uh, was a Sosego cup of gold ore, and we were suggesting that is there, is there a selectivity in between particles whereby the machine is gonna just selectively crash like five of the twenty particles that are with, with matter, and so we suggest we 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 asking the question is there a selectivity in between particles? The simplest case scenario whereby you have two particles is the machine gonna be selectively crash this one? So, and the second question I'm gonna I'm just gonna leave it. I, I shouldn't have added the second question. Um, so that's the first sample I processed. It's a uh, it's uh, iron couple ore. The couple head grade is actually very high. It's 1.2 or 1.4 something. So once you crash them, you can actually see chalcopyrite in the final end of the product. And you look at the cross end of the product. They look pretty barren and they look pretty hard. Then we're like, okay, maybe it is true that the machine is gonna selectively crash the one waste matter. So what we did was that this is just one sample. We test another three all samples. We tested a total of four all samples at the beginning. So what we do is that we we crash them and they will be like this, and we screen them, and we screen them into say five size fractions, and you assay each size fraction, and you you see a difference in the couple grade in between different size fractions. You realize that the couple grade of the coarse particles are really low, and at the final end of the product, the couple grade is really high. There's almost 10 times difference in, for this case. And 
based on the resu these results, you can get the mass at different size fraction, uh, mass recovery and couple recovery at different size fractions. And now if someone says, says um, I want a minimal 80% of couple recovery, you can just select the cutting size at 22.4, whereby you, 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 you only need to keep 60% of the feet and you can still get 86% of the matter and you can reject 40% of the, the feet. Now if some, if the, they apply a different criteria saying I want the uh, rejection couple grade to be lesser than 0.1%, and you can you just need to move your cutting screen to 13.2 whereby you can keep 63 of the kappa and you can reject over 70 percent of the uh, original mass so the thing is that um you always have to repeat the test if i mean you just have to repeat your test but otherwise timmy is going to have a huge problem with me if i don't repeat the test so when i actually do repeat the test and we realized um, there's huge variations in between different repeated tests. So you can see over here uh, the test one, two, four, it's repeated tests all based on 40 particles. And just based on this um, mass recovery and couple recovery, you can draw a figure that looks like this. Uh, so this figure also corresponds to size. Um, and uh, we realized there's a at the same cutting size, there's huge variations in terms of mass recovery and couple recovery. Say, uh, if you choose a cutting size at 22.4, the couple recovery for these four repeat tests, it goes from uh, 40 to 60. Uh, sorry, the mass recovery goes from 40 to 60, and the couple recovery goes from probably from 75 to 85. So there's a huge variation. It's like you do. You do your test one, you can reject 40%. You do your test three, you can reject 60%. And that variation is just too big. And so a question obviously surface, that is how many particles you need to, to produce a representative product. So um, the idea is to, okay, just do multiple repeats at 50 particles, 100 particles, 200 particles, and 500 particles, and et cetera. And, but that's just going to, because the self rag union we have is not a continuous operating system, it's going to take months to do just one test. So we had to come up with something else. So what we come up with to first do multiple repeats as small a number of particles. Say we do four repeats at 40 particles, then you can combine two of them. It's just uh, add the mass together and add, it should be fairly easy and all of a sudden, you just did four repeats at 40 particles, you all of a sudden have four repeats at 80 particles. And of course you can also combine three of them, and all of a sudden you have three repeats at 120 particles. So without doing, without actually doing four repeats at 80 particles and 120 particles. So that saved me a lot of time. And based on these repeats, you can calculate, calculate the COV value of different parameters of interest. So, so say you have three repeats at uh, 120 particles, you can, you can calculate the CLV value of couple recovery of the feet grade of, of everything. And you can then apply a criteria over here to say, okay, I need the CLV value of couple recovery to be smaller than 10%, then you probably only need 30 particles. But if, if people say, okay, I need your undersized couple grade CLV value to be smaller than 10%, you'll probably need like 135 particles. So that's a good way of avoiding doing a lot of um, lengthy and repeated work, but still getting to know the how many particles you actually need. And after the determination of how much, how many particles that we need, we try to, as a PhD, you always have to get to the fundamental part of this thing. So, so we play around with synthetic particles. So the thing that's good with synthetic particles you can is that you can predefine a lot of things about this thing. You can you can decide its hardness, its shape, and you can you can manipulate its electrical properties. And once again, the simplest case scenario whereby we want to see if there's a selectivity between in between two particles is that we we make a particle that's with matter and we make another particle that's without matter, and we make sure these two particles they are 
similar in every way aside from the fact that there's a metal on the particle on the right. So it, we, we did prove that the electrical pulse like has, has a strong um, prosperity for crashing the one that's with uh, um, meta. So of course we not only play with this. This is also this is a similar case scenario. We also played with this is chocolate pyrite inside. Inside we have pyrite, we have magnetite, we have ganina, we have mica. We not only do two particles, we do three particles, and we put a the one we embedded with magnetite and another one embedded with pyrite. So you 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 not only use a single grain, you use finely disseminated pyrite. You embedded them in there. You move this thing up and down, and you have loads of experimental configurations to play with. And I'm just talking about the, this only one here. You, you can talk just about this for 30 minutes, but um, just need to know that the selectivity of this thing is because of the meta we embedded in there. And um, uh, I have a video of a lot of people have seen that demonstration already, but. Um, still going to show it to the people who haven't seen this. In process, we have two synthetic particles over here. Uh, the one marked with the cross is a barren one. The other one is embedded with a chuckle pyrite inside. And we're expecting the machine to selectively crash this. One. And now we place this tree in the processing myself. <laughs> As you can see over here, once you apply a screen for the progeny particles, the one that's marked with the cross is the only one that remains on the screen oversize. And you can easily separate it because you know the one marked with the cross is a barren one, whereby those particles are broken. You can clearly see the burning traces over here. These are the chocolate pyrite we embedded inside. And these particles, they are more or less um, working, and you can see the cracks on the surface of this progeny particle. And yeah, uh, sometimes you can even break them with your hand because the AB value is very high for this particle over here. As you can see over here, you can easily break them with your hand. So you can see this is going to achieve significant energy saving for the downstream process. All right. Now, after the synthetic particles, we start processing the actual rocks. As you can see, we have two rocks over here. This one is clearly enriched with metal. You can see the pyrite over here. And this one is looks sparing to us. And we're hoping the machine could selectively crash this one. Um, now you can see the metal floating on the surface. Um, now we take a look at the product. Now as you can see, the one that's enriched with metal is clearly broken into two pieces. And the one that's buried remains intact. And if you apply a screen for this product, the screen size over here is 26.5. And if you apply a screen and you can see these particles, it will go to the screen on the side, so like this one. It will remain on the screen all the size, and you can separate this spare rock. Okay, that's very good advertisement. Uh, I'm just gonna... Uh, so, um, that was a selective fragmentation thing. So, when you do a demonstration, you use a simplest case scenario whereby people understand it very well, because just two particles, but in the real test, of course, we we put like loads of particles in there and do the do the do the real test. And the thing the we play around with the synthetic particles. There's a reason we play around with the synthetic particles. Not only to figure out why the the electrical pulse to to is gonna crash the one with meta, but also um, Frank was always saying um, um, is just sometimes it gives me this feeling that maybe it's just because in in the real test we achieve free concentration. It may just be because 
the one with meta is really soft and you just so happens you crash them and and the one that's barren just really hard and you can't crash them and then you have a, a pre-concentration it's not really because of selectivity and stuff so so we're trying to play different geological components with the synthetic particles but there's very limited things that we can do with the synthetic particles so um, you can I can put a single grain in the middle I can put find a disseminated pyrite in that whole ground matrix. But I, I talked to John about this. Can we actually create a vein-like structure? Can you actually, like, actually, it's, it's after all synthetic particles. You, you can't eventually apply everything to the real rocks. You, you just can't. So you have to deal with real rocks. And we uh, recently had help from Travis actually sorting our feed particles into different geological components. Then we test these particles one by one to see and to, to take a look at the rock if it's with matter, if it's because of its hardness. It just, this is uh, something that I still haven't done that I'm about to do in the, probably in the next few months if I still got time. Um, yeah, I, and I have a, I absolutely no idea how Travis sort them into six of them. And I recognize this pen from with help with Alice. And uh, but other than that, I have absolutely no idea. Some of the words I can't. I don't even know what that means. So uh, and anyway, um, and the the synthetic particles I just showed you, they were based on external evidence. Whereby I take a lot of photos, I screen them, but I also try to get like into the particle using um, X-ray CT. So once again, I'm just gonna assume everyone knows about X-ray CT. So take slices and you put them together and you get a you get a 3d structure of, of what's inside that um, synthetic particle so the blue stuff over here are L voids inside and the yellow stuff they are chocolate pirate in there um, so this is a synthetic particle whereby I embedded a chocolate pirate in there so I use CT scan to scan them and use HVP to treat them and you realize there's a hole that's going right to that chocolate pyrite and develop to the ground electrode. So it's penetrate the synthetic particle. You see that it is indeed because of the fact that the domain discharge channel goes to that metal grain that we embedded in there. The this, this thing that's really painful about this is that um, you also see this small shiny yellow bit over here. That's just so sad. It's just the first time I uh, sent my um, samples to be scanned, I saw this uh, yellow bit and I was like okay did I mess up did I ac accidentally put some fine chocolate pirate in there so it's contamination but I actually had a chat with um, Cassie and Milan and um, they we actually had to do an MLA test to determine this uh, contaminants their their rutile so it's just uh, it's a very cheap um, so rutile is pretty common over here in Australia and all the sand and stuff and it's a very cheap raw material for people to make grow so so they actually added in there and i didn't know that which which is i, I finished all the tests and everything but the thing is that we actually determined we checked the rutile conductivity and permittivity we zapped a lot of um, barren particles and we actually determined that um, the rutile is not going to contribute to the final selective fragmentation behavior and um, another thing that's really interesting about this is that um, we actually found that the electrical pulse went right into this mineral grain. You can see it's already been crashed. But in the literature, since, ever since this technique was invented, people are saying that it's going to go to the boundary of this thing and provide perfect liberation. So we are actually suggesting otherwise. So this is something huge in, the, in, the, in, in high voltage pulses, but it might be very boring in, for people who are not digging really deep into this thing. Um, in addition to the uh, 3D um, um, visualization of your product, you can also get quantified results based on your scan images, whereby you can get how much cracks you, you have in there. You can see the crack distribution along the, along the particles. So you scan them from the top to the bottom. You have, um, I scan the, the particle height is about 20 millimeter, and I have about a thousand images in between zero to 20. And this is just one of the images that I show you over here. 
So you can get quantified results about your cracks and everything. So yeah, that's that's also very interesting. And another thing that we found was that in addition to the selective weakening effect, we found a selective weakening effect. And that's really good because initially we thought that you apply one electrical pulse to two particles. They're supposed to like receive the same amount of energy, have the same weakening effect, but no. It actually is, you can see the cracks are all accumulated on the broken particles, whereby the barren ones looks still pretty intact to me. So, but that's just, again, from appearance. So we had to do RBD tests to test the uh, percentage changing AB value of, of the broken particle, of, of this broken particle and the barren particle. And we, we did experimentally proven that um, the broken particles has much bigger percentage changing AB value in comparison with the unbroken particles. So uh, the C for chocolate pyrite means, uh, CB means we have a synthetic particle that's embedded with chocolate pyrite and B means barren. So two particles are barren and chocolate pyrite embedded synthetic particle. And PF for pine, uh, fine pyrite embedded synthetic particle. Another interesting thing from this results is that um, it looks to us, it seems to us that the um, PFB configuration achieved much better pre awakening results with, in comparison with the CB um, configuration, and that's also really interesting. It seems to us that if a particle is, 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 is with finely dissimilated mineral grains, it's more likely to achieve better pre awakening results than the, the single grain in the middle of that thing. So it's, we're playing with all this synthetic particle to, to determine if different geological components of, of a rock is gonna, is gonna perform differently to HVP fragmentation. But uh, all this, the, the real conclusion will count, cannot be drawn on the synthetic particles eventually. We will still have to test on the real rocks. And after the synthetic particles, we did a lot of case studies. So we test all one, I test all two, and I test all three, and Daniel tests all four. We're at this stage whereby we're building up our database and we test different all samples with different energy input. We apply mechanical crashing methods as a benchmark. And like all one, clearly HVAP is better than the JKRBT, and we have all two whereby the uh, HVAP just achieves similar results as, a, as the RBT. And we had a third one, um, which didn't work out very well, and 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 we had a fourth one that worked exceptionally well. So, but um, it's just we're just trying different all samples right now, and uh, so that that was just copper I was talking about. And the thing that before I've always just showed a uh, couple results because um, we had a handheld exercise from Vlad, and uh, that can and it can only assay copper, and when it comes to gold, it's just uh, just count assay gold and so until we had the projects going and we can actually assay the gold we realized that somehow gold results are um, much better than copper so if you achieve a decent copper pre-concentration performance you're going to have awesome gold pre-concentration performance and um, that's something also that, that's very interesting um, i hope i could just buy some pure gold and put them in the synthetic particle to to see but that's just uh too expensive, and um, of, of course we also apply uh, uh, RBT as three different energy levels to see the pre-concentration performance of, of the mechanical crashing methods. And it's actually pretty interesting that even the mechanical crashing methods you have pretty good pre-concentration at the uh, final end of the product. So um, um, yes, at large energy input. So I'd say this is a this is a result of the um, size reduction, probably. Um, finally, I'll talk about the, uh, that comes to my conclusion. It's nice, well, right. So I'm gonna, so we, we, we discovered this method to do pre-concentration using multiple particles. And we know that the electrical pulse is gonna selectively crash the one that's with matter. So we know the energy consumption is relatively low because Ideally, say you have two particles, you only need one pulse to differentiate two particles. That's of course ideally. And like you have five particles, one of them is with matter, you also only need one pulse. 
Um, and uh, in addition to this selective fragmentation effect, like I just said, we also have a selective weakening bonus adding to that, whereby literally no energy wasted on this one because there's no AB value change, no nothing change to that one. We actually just city scan on this one and there's also nothing showing up. So it's really good because we're using all our energy in the particle that's with meta. And so high energy efficiency, of course. And another thing is uh, finally, I think this also have a, this multi particle thing also has a positive implication for the machine throughput because before you're always processing one particle at a time. And right now you can process what, 10, 15, 20 particles at a time. And, and I think this is gonna provide another boost to the uh, machine circuit. And, but the thing, the, the, the thing is that so far all my tests are based on the, the, the bench unit we have downstairs and there's no continuous operating system yet. Um, um, Frank, Frank was, I think at the beginning of 2017, he said, wait, 2017 is gonna be an exciting year for us because we're finally gonna get our hands on that on that system, but it looks like we're gonna have to wait until 2018, early 2018. <laughs> and um, uh, yeah, but yeah, it is very exciting that once we got a more customized um, electro configuration, and that's really built for pre-concentration, and I would be very interested to see how the results will be like. And um, yeah, so the point plan electro, sorry, uh, it's just the, with, we did some tests and realized that point plan electrode configuration is not really good for pre concentration. And uh, yeah, and finally, um, I have a lot of people to thank for, and uh, I'm going to save it for my review. It's coming up in two weeks and save everyone some time and go to the question part. That was a really good explanation of, of your whole process. So I'll open it to the floor to the question. Can I just stop this?